This time on the show, I'm joined by David Fuller. David Fuller is the uh, co-founder of Rebel Wisdom, a media company that if you're familiar with Emerge, I'm sure you've seen some of their content. They interview people uh, like Jordan Greenhall, Jamie Wheel, uh, Jordan Peterson, all of the people that have factored in to the conversations that we've been having on the podcast and have been playing such an important role in our culture right now as the various uh, sense-making institutions, as Jordan Greenhall would say, begin to deteriorate. And so uh, David is joining me for a kind of conversation about Rebel Wisdom. It's just passed 50,000 subscribers. Congratulations, David. Uh, you know, uh, about what inspired him to begin this project, why he thinks it's hit such a nerve uh, with people, what they're all subscribing, uh, and where this conversation, you know, sometimes associated with the intellectual dark web is going and why it's so important. So uh, David, welcome to Emerge. Thank you, Daniel. Looking forward to it. Yeah, and so to, to get it started, you know, um, <laughs> It's, I, I know from personal experience, it's, it's one thing to be on uh, the interviewee or interviewer side of the equation. It's another thing to be interviewed. And so I find myself curious, um, what for you was the inspiration to move out of the, your work with the BBC and the media and, and create what is a pretty radical departure, this whole rebel wisdom media project? What was behind that for you? Yeah, I have to say, I prefer asking the questions rather than answering them, but yeah, um, I'm sure we'll. we'll <laughs> um, yeah, it's been very spontaneous for quite a long time. When I was working, I worked for Channel 4 News for many years. I left to do documentaries for Channel 4 and for the BBC. Channel 4 News, for people who aren't sort of familiar with the UK, is is generally regarded as probably one of the two most high quality news programs and I was working for the foreign unit so I was in Libya during the the fall of Gaddafi I was in Tahrir Square um, when Mubarak resigned which was an amazing opportunity and something that hmm. I'll never forget like I was really at the, at the center of some fairly amazing moments but at the same time when I look back there was something that was kind of missing in terms of my feeling of where I was meant to be and what I was meant to be doing. And I think that goes back to, I studied philosophy and I'd always been doing a lot of personal growth work and been very interested in spirituality and very interested in what you might call the kind of paradigm shift and feeling very keenly that there is the need for this paradigm shift, especially out of, out of sort of the naive materialism of the culture that we're in at the moment and realizing that that kind of perspective was not very easy to bring into the mainstream media. Yeah. Most of the gatekeepers in the mainstream media were sort of under the sway of the sort of very Dawkinsite hmm. scientific realism. So th those kind of programs that looked at kind of the reality of spiritual experience or religion or the sort of the full 360 degree picture of what it means to be human were not yeah. being commissioned and also i just had this sense that yeah there was there were perspectives that were not being brought forward into the media i didn't really know what to do about that at the time and i don't think the technology technology existed to be able to do anything about it at the time either and it's sort mm -hmm. of been this technological revolution and then rebel wisdom happened very spontaneously you could even say synchronistically because I saw Jordan Peterson emerge probably about 18 months ago. And my immediate reaction, I dive, I dove very deeply into the Bible lectures. I was immediately struck by here was someone talking about Jung. Here was someone talking about the deep mythopoetic structure of the world. And I was completely gripped by the message. And I just had this very strong sense this is exactly what our culture is missing right now. Mm. This is effectively what we've forgotten. Mm. And he, and so I, I went to go over to Toronto actually to a Bible lecture. I, I thought, well, some people pay, I don't know, a few hundred pounds to go and see their favorite sports team. I might as well go and see him give a lecture. Yeah. And it wasn't until I'd actually booked to go for the Bible lecture. That I thought, well, 
I am a journalist. I could ask him if, for an interview. And mm. so I did. And he, he granted me an interview the day after the lecture, which I was mm. very pleased by. Mm. And then we did the interview. And it wasn't until I'd actually done the interview that I thought, well, no one's actually made a documentary about him yet. Mm. This was October 2017, I think. Yeah. And this was well before most people had ever heard of him as well. Yeah. So I then thought, okay, I'm going to turn it into a documentary, which I did over the next couple of months. And that became Truth in the Time of Chaos, the first documentary. And I still think, I still think it's worth people maybe going back and having a look at the interview that I did with him in, in October 2017, because yeah. there's a real, I asked him a lot about Jung, a lot about the integration of the shadow. That's when things start to line up. Yeah. And the more you're in that space, the more they line up. And so the question is, if you're like really in that space, mm. how much do things line up? I've had experiences where everything came together, you know, and, and, and they're very, very powerful experiences. And, and they're, they're also characterized by, it's like everything turns into a musical symphony where each part is exactly appropriate for that moment. And... And I think music actually expresses that, which is partly why music produces transcendent experiences, you know. I think it is an intimation of paradise, it's something like that. Um, and you can think about that psychologically, you know, because it also makes sense psychologically that your optimal experiences are going to occur when you're most united with yourself. And But I don't know what... See, we don't exactly understand the relationship between our consciousness and the world. We're at our best when we're integrated completely. And there, there's an effect of that integration in principle on what we would normally regard as external reality. Because external reality can line up with that integration as well. And so-called external reality. You know, I also think that figures like the Buddha, you know, he's an exemplar of the possibilities of that alignment. And the exercises, the yogic exercises, for example, are attempts to bring that alignment into being. You know, I mean, it's very centered on the body, which is quite interesting, even though it's a spiritual tradition, right? It's very, very centered on the body. And I think people probably experience that when they have peak sexual experiences with someone, you know, where there's real intimacy because they're in the same place at the same time and everything comes together for that moment, you know? Maybe literally. Yes, yes, literally, right. And, and, and I also don't think that that linguistic usage is uh, chance, right? Because I think that's a place where that experience is a brief intimation of, of heaven. That might be a way of thinking about it. I've really not seen him ask those kind of questions many times since. A lot of people have really focused on the politics, have right. focused on the gender stuff and it's i think it's really missing the point to look at peterson through a political and gender politics lens i mean it's a valid they're valid questions to ask for sure and he's definitely a controversial figure and mm -hmm. i think there's a lot to unpack in his worldview but to have someone arguing for the reality of spiritual experience the reality of something like psychedelics to bring about that spiritual experience the reality of a deep mythopoetic layer that we need to connect to and seeing him arguing that on the on the kind of world stage is still astonishing to an academic who's who's quoting Jung despite the fact he was told from the beginning of his academic career don't mention Jung you'll torpedo your career if you do mm. it, it's a it's an astonishing thing that we should not forget I think um despite what's happened since totally. and so yeah. I mean there, there's so many different kind of tangents we could go down already I'm sure but I just wanted to complete the, 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 the answer of where Rebel Wisdom came from because it then, I then turned it into this documentary and then a few days after I released that documentary, he then had that famous encounter with Kathy Newman on Channel 4 News where I had been working only a few weeks before. I was still freelancing there even though I'd left there. Um. And so... And considering most of my interview with Jordan Peterson was about synchronicity and was about these kind of meaningful coincidences and how do we make sense of them and what, how do we follow the thread of these synchronicities? That was an extraordinary 
mm. synchronicity. And at first, what I tried to do was to liaise behind the scenes because it was almost like seeing um, your parents fighting or something. It was Channel 4 News had one perspective and they were very upset because Kathy was getting a lot of abuse online. Jordan mm. Peterson was very upset because he felt that um, he was being framed as the villain and, and he hadn't done anything wrong. And I thought, and he wanted another interview with Kathy and I tried to liaise between them. That didn't get anywhere. Uh, Jordan was happy to do it. Kathy and Channel 4 News were just, just wanted it to go away by that point. Hmm. Um, and so that process of what am I supposed to do with this strange coincidence turned into the film Glitch in the Matrix, which hmm. I pretty much came through in a, in a real sort of flow state over about two weeks in January 2018. Mm. And it, it included an awful lot of things that had been, I've been thinking about since the Trump election. So mm. Jordan Greenhall, I got in touch with and did an interview with him and he's a big voice in the film. Ken Wilber's Trump and a post-truth world was not actually named in there, but it was a real underpinning mm. of a lot of the a lot of the arguments in it. And actually when I spoke to Jeff Salzman of the Daily Evolver, he said that documentary was a pure integral download, which I was very mm. pleased with because it was very informed by the shadow of liberalism. What is it, what is the liberal overreach that we're seeing at the moment that's provoking Trump, provoking Brexit, provoking this kind of rejection of mm. what everyone up until 2016 thought was a kind of, liberal an ever more liberal society and what it what is it that liberal liberals need to own about their own shadow their own kind of tribalism that pretends that it's not a tribalism to for for the conversation to move forward and so glitch in the matrix then jordan peterson watched it loved it and put it on his channel and that has that's been by far the most viewed piece it's been viewed over a million times on jordan's channel and has is, is still the piece that people kind of get in touch the most about. And mm. one little kind of uh, big head of plug, I, I've sort of been tracking it since Jordan put it onto his channel. It's now, I think, either the fifth or the sixth most viewed piece on his own channel. On his channel. Uh, on his channel, which is pretty amazing, considering yeah. it only went up about a year ago, and some of the stuff there has been yeah. up there for, for years. Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's the, the long and the short of it. Um, there were these two films that, that emerged very spontaneously. And then the, the channel emerged off the back of that. And yeah. I clearly kind of leveraged my experience with Channel 4 and the BBC into getting the interview with Jordan Peterson. There's clearly a, a, a kind of ceiling as to where you can get with a podcast or a channel until you've got a couple of big names on it and then you can use that as your reputation yeah. to get more people on. And I was yeah, lucky enough totally. with that, with, with my background and with the access to Jordan Peterson to be able to, to kind of springboard onto some other big names. Yeah. Well, and that's, I mean, what I'm really struck by in, in the story you just shared and also just in watching this unfold in real time, because I remember, you know, when you release these documentaries, I, I recall when Jordan Peterson really just sort of exploded onto the scene and that it, it felt like he was kind of breaking some sort of conversational seal that then many other actors came in behind him, right? He was kind of this, this first mover who then opened up this whole new territory that, I now associate Rebel Wisdom very much with convening people uh, in, right? And it's this, I guess, you know, you've used this term and you've explored this term through Rebel, Rebel Wisdom of the intellectual dark web. It was it was a Brett Weinstein or Eric that, that coined that? Eric. Eric Weinstein coined this term, the intellectual dark web. And so you've done, I think, a lot of... Mm, careful study of that term and what, 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 what exactly it is that people are describing when they, they, they use that phrase. What, what's your perspective on it now as somebody who I think is more and more responsible for, uh, for it? You know, you're kind of hosting these conversations that people are increasingly identifying with the intellectual dark web. 
So what's, what, what's going on there? Now? It's a really good question because we have the, the phenomenon that has now got the name, the intellectual dark web. And then we yeah. have the intellectual dark web itself, which is, if you look at the, the New York Times article that Barry Weiss wrote, I think in summer 2018, probably the names in that are the names of the people who are officially in the intellectual dark web there. I know Barry, Barry Weiss was talking quite a lot to the members of it and to Eric who came up with the term mm -hmm. and also the origin of that, of what has now kind of surfaced as the intellectual dark web, as this kind of space for conversation we released a film glitch in the matrix two actually a couple of weeks ago, which was a long illustrated interview with Eric talking about where the term came from and where, why it's necessary given the structures that he's seen being erected since the 1980s in inside institutional frameworks and mm. how institutional frameworks have steadily more and more been keeping out the, vo the heterodox voices mm. and how we've replaced genuine genius and with e genius with excellence effectively that mm. as structures develop what they reward is people who go along with an already existing status quo excellent people who play by the rules rather than people who challenge the the paradigms that those organizations are based on. And if you continue to do that, what you end up with is very fragile institutions, especially once those institutions are under more and more pressure and there are more destabilizing forces mm -hmm. as there are in the, in the culture right now. And I think that's really worth, I, I'd really urge anyone to go and watch that documentary and maybe we'll play a clip from it now. I would say that everybody in the IDW is fairly disagreeable in the sense of the big five personality inventory. So can you hold a position when you're the only person in a room that believes that thing? Like if it's you versus a hundred people, I would say almost everybody in the core of the IDW uh, is capable of holding a position where everyone is against you. And I think that that trait is extremely rare. Do you see the IDW as primarily a political project? No, I don't. I, I see it primarily as a precursor to anything decent. It, it, it's what has to succeed for us to have a political conversation. I don't think we're having a political conversation. It's this kind of loosely affiliated network of people and who's quote unquote in or out of the IDW. You know, there doesn't seem to be any kind of boundary there. Uh, but it does seem to be performing a purpose, which is presencing all of these heterodox, as you say, ideas into the discourse. And my, I have a feeling like there is some kind of emerging worldview being articulated not by any single individual, but through the collective conversation, like the gestalt of the conversation as it happens across many different mediums and so I think the nature of the IDW makes it so that people like yourself, you know, curators, the people who are having the, like hosting the conversations are in a kind of unique position because unlike the people you're talking to, you're not as much locked into a particular perspective. And so I, I, one of the things I'm most curious about is, you know, what's your sense of this emerging worldview? Like what, 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 what are the bound, like what are the contours of it? What's, what are, What's being articulated, not by any single individual, but by the, the, the kind of collective? I think, like I said before, it's really interesting to look at what is the emerging, what is the emerging phenomenon that is outside the IDW itself? Because if you say who is in the IDW at the moment, I think that's a very, it's very difficult to know. I think it, it is pretty much whoever Eric Weinstein says is in the IDW. Right. Uh, and yet there is an emerging consensus that is certainly applying to more than just the IDW. I mean, you can look at the success of something like Quillette 
as an online mm. magazine. Claire Lehman started it in, in Australia, I think in 2015, and it's just gone from strength to strength mm. uh, over the last year, especially. And that's, that's a really good, that's a really good place to look, I think. And, and Quillette pretty much is filling the void that Quillette is filling. It's kind of known as sort of the in-house online magazine for the IDW. Mm. And if you look at the void that it's filling, it's the, it's the interaction between academia and the media. And there mm. are things that are well known and established in academia. For example, the innate differences between men and women that are not acknowledged in the media. And a lot of what has happened is there's a worldview that's hardened into an ideology in the media that is not really supported by the academic research. It's become more and more, it's what Jordan Greenhall describes as the blue church. Yes. The blue church has mistaken the values of openness for an ideology of openness. Hmm. And that's a really, I thought that's a really great yeah. way of phrasing it. What we started with coming through in the 60s was a worldview that valued genuine openness and inclusivity and diversity and all of these very valuable, essential values, especially if we're talking from a kind of, if we looked at it through as kind of Wilbur spiral dynamics lens, we could say it's a green worldview. But that worldview has become increasingly an ideology. And there are certain views that you must have and certain views that you must not have within that ideology. And it's mm -hmm. become increasingly policed by Twitter more than anything, it seems. So there are certain yes. things that you can say and certain things you can't say. One, one good example, if you're looking for a kind of overall frame, is the Google memo was a really interesting moment in, sure. in culture. Yeah. And Quillette, one of their big breakthrough articles was for academics respond to the Google memo and it went viral mm. because mm. they were able to, because Claire May Lehman was an academic herself. So she was able to know exactly who the right people were to go to, to say, okay, look at the, the Google memo that James Damore put together, which was characterized in the media as an anti-diversity screed. They literally mm. called it an anti-diversity screed. And there's even people, there was an article in the Atlantic by Connor Friersdorf, I think, who said he's never seen a, a document that was publicly available to so many journalists be mischaracterized by so many journalists. Mm. And so there was a real failure along the, by, the, by the mainstream media around the Google memo. And mm. then, so it had all of these graphs, it had all of these kind of, and he, he explicitly framed it as if we want to increase diversity in tech, we're being told that the only reason for the lack of diversity is discrimination. There could be other reasons. And he even put forward mm. some suggestions, which are if men are on balance, more interested in things and women are more interested in people, maybe we should introduce more working together in teams. He actually put forward some, some suggestions of what to do about it. But then mm -hmm. the, the Quillette, so Quillette were then able to, to get four academics to respond to it and pretty much say he got most of the science right. Um, he, mm -hmm. I mean, there, there may be things that he over, overplayed, but he got most of the science right. And for him to effectively have been sacked for that, certainly right. threw a chill, put a chill into just about everyone working in tech. It made it absolutely clear to everyone mm. working in tech where the boundaries were and the, where the boundaries were, how far they could go. And that was a, that was a hugely significant, significant cultural moment. Mm. It's a moment where the media failed and Quillette was able to, to fill a gap and I think that's, that for me, I think is where the, that, that's where most of the, the emerging worldview is. It's, it's actually restoring the value of academic truth. And you can't really do that without pointing to the hat, an ideology has emerged that is trying to shut down a lot of debates. And you can't really get away from that. And I, I'd, I'd like to play a piece actually from, from Brett Weinstein now where he talks about that. So we are all watching something 
move across the landscape and alter what can be said, where it can be said, what kinds of language have to be used. And many people will tell you, nobody really believes that. And then others will tell you, oh, it's a tiny number of people, so it's, you're blowing the danger out of proportion. But those of us who are paying attention to it are watching institution after institution be lobotomized by these arguments that really don't rise to the level of a good discussion in a college dorm. These are not high quality arguments. They are not robust in the face of what is understood as a result of decades or in some cases centuries of study in different disciplines. So how is it that these wrong arguments carry so much power? That's the question. The answer in general is that game theory provides loopholes where people can have power that is disproportionate to their numbers and disproportionate to the power of the logic underlying what they are saying. So um, the wielding of stigma in such a way that causes people to be much more likely to voice one perspective than the counter perspective, understanding the, uh, the biases that exist as a result of a sometimes cynical use of game theory. Him and his wife Heather Hying were the, the most high profile victims of campus activism in the U in the US in Evergreen College they yeah. they were effectively they ended up being run out of the college by a mob uh who were accusing them of being racists and i think anyone mm -hmm. who looks into it would would pretty quickly see that 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 was not that they certainly were not racist they were they were very progressive people who were on the the receiving end of a of an ideology mm -hmm. and that, that's, that's why this is such a difficult conversation to unpack, because all of these are very good values. And so mm. it's very easy, but any value taken to an extreme, if it becomes your kind of guiding axiom, can turn into madness. And mm -hmm. as Eric Weinstein, another member of the IDW, said on the Dave Rubin show with Brett Weinstein, you, you cannot build a cosmology on oppression. It leads to insanity. And that, yeah. I think, is, yeah, if, we, if we're kind of naming what the, the IDW is, it's a, it's a space where we can have conversations without being accused of certain things that will generally shut that conversation down. Right, right. And it also seems like, broadly speaking, people within the IDW and this, I mean, you're right, like the IDW, if it's just people that Brett Weinstein says are in it, like that's not as interesting as I think this kind of emerging conversational space that's quite a bit bigger, that's enabled by new technologies, right? I, I, and, and that is playing host to conversations that are not based in ideology, or at least are attempting to do something other than merely uh, kind of uh, ideological possession and then speech acts, you know, and, and two of the, the two kind of battle in, in, in the dark and nothing actually happens. And, and, you know, I, I appreciate the way Jordan Greenhall is, is articulating a move towards a kind of generative, non-ideological coherence building conversation that takes place between and among sovereign individuals which in my mind, as a kind of naive optimist, is where I hope the IDW and this, this kind of emerging conversational space is headed. And I, I guess I'm curious for, for you as another person who's convening these conversations and talking to people, uh, is like, where do you see this headed? Uh, what's, what's, what's your sense of what the future might bring for this, this whole phenomenon, this whole network? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question because it really fits. So I think pretty much everyone who's been following the emergence of Jordan Peterson, the emergence of the IDW, and this sense that there is a teleology to this conversation. There is a direction to this conversation, and it's very much one that I've been very aware in uh, with Rebel Wisdom, and it's something that we're hoping to get more and more in a position to... Um, to influence as well. And you mentioned Jordan Greenhall. Jordan Greenhall is one of the, certainly one of the most fascinating and important thinkers that we found since we've been starting to, to follow this thread. Yeah. And it, it is leading in that direction. And it's something that 
like like we said before, there's the IDW and there's the emerging conversation that's under the underneath it. And I think mm -hmm. that I would love to see that kind of that grouping extended to include people like Jordan Greenhall, include mm -hmm. people like Jamie Wheel, who I think mm -hmm. is oh, is yeah. holding a really vital piece. Jamie Wheel wrote Stealing Fire and is a flow states expert. What what I find what I find with Jordan Greenhall and with Jamie Wheel is they're they're both bringing this deep felt sense of the liminal, yes. and and that's something that can't be faked. I'll, I'll add Daniel Schmachtenberger into that as well. There's this 100%. there's this really deep felt sense of speaking from a liminal space, and how do we collectively go into that liminal space where the right answers will emerge? Right. Because without that. I don't think we're going to get through. And I think that's the crucial, that's the crucial thing that we need to do is to learn to get into this into subjective sense making. And what prevents you getting into it is thinking that you already know the answers. Yes. And so it's a, so what we're looking at then are what are the embodied practices that are able to put us into a state of sovereignty, into a mm. state of allowing ourselves to be wrong, allowing mm. ourselves to give up, and this is again going back to Jordan Peterson. I think he tells that beautifully about allowing the dead wood to be burnt off. Hmm. There's something really vital about how do we genuinely get into this space of intersubjective sense making, and yes. and how do we do that collectively? I know that's that's really the focus of Jordan Greenhall's work, and it's hmm. something that we. It's definitely something that we are attempting to do with Rebel Wisdom. It's the next. It's the next stage of the project. So we uh -huh. already have a, an event coming up in, in May called the summit where we, yes. we already, we have Jordan Greenhall, Brett Weinstein, Heather Hying and Ian McGilchrist who are tremendous thinkers in themselves, hopefully demonstrating on stage, entering into thinking in public, demonstrating this kind of intersubjective process themselves. Yes. And then we're also, we have 150 guests and we're going to break them into small groups and, and hopefully facilitate them to get into that space themselves as well. That's fantastic. And, that's and how, how, how directed are you being in terms of like, uh, is there a goal for harnessing that collective intelligence? Cause I imagine the 150 people that make their way to your event will be uh, pretty interesting people capable, hopefully of doing this kind of work, you know, uh, uh, yes. What, what's the, what, what are you, are you attempting to produce anything or is it more proof of concept or what's the, um, it is kind of proof of concept. We've done it a few times already in smaller events nice. and this is the largest one that we'll have done. Yeah. And exactly at the Dunbar number. It's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, That's interesting. Um, yeah, yeah it, it is, it is a kind of, proof of concept in some ways. And what I think we need to do is establish and create a field which works, a community of people who are doing this together. I think the UK is a good place to do that for reasons I can go into <laughs> later. Um, I think for various cultural reasons, we have a chance of avoiding the kind of almost instant polarization that we seem to see in America whenever something happens there is a there's just this instant splitting into two camps I think that's America's kind of genius in some ways is this polarization and kind of dialectic process but it's also your your drawback as well and I think yeah. the UK has a talent for synthesis and I think the mm. way the way I think we need to do it is to build a build a field of people who are able to enter into that space that can then maintain that space against bad actors. Cause I have a feeling mm. that most of the, the ideology that s can come in and wreck conversations is, is done through a kind of social shaming tactic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's done through certain keywords and certain key ob objections that then look for, support within the within the group to, mm -hmm. to derail to derail conversations and i think if we can build a functioning field where there and the, the other thing we've done with the with the summit is there's a sign up form when you when you 
uh, sign up that says, effectively, I agree to enter into this collaborative process. I agree mm. to leave my ideology at the door, et cetera, et cetera. That, which is an idea we got from Brett and Heather for how they managed to, to, to do their conversations at Evergreen. Because the other mm. thing to, to realize about Brett and Heather is they're both evolutionary biologists talking mm. about the reality of biological sex differences, all of these topics that have become incredibly difficult to talk about in, in and around the modern left. And they were doing this in one of the most progressive colleges, probably the most progressive college in America. And they managed to, to teach there for over a decade with no complaints, no, like they, they, they'd mastered it. it. The people who protested against them were not their own students. So and the, one of the ways they did it was yeah. to get people to sign up to a covenant when they entered into the class. As, uh -huh. as Brett says, people are on a massive hair trigger for any sense of exclusion. So the only way to deal with that is to turn around that issue into these are the ground rules you've signed up for. If you choose not to obey them, you are excluding yourself. Mm. So yeah. the only way to do it is to have a set of ground rules and then to have some way of enforcing those. So someone who's willing to enforce those as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, what, what strikes me in hearing you describe your intentions for the event and, and for Rebel Wisdom moving forward is it's a really uh, uh, big shift in the purpose of broadcast media, right? Like, I, I think if I'm going to use a sort of simplified picture of what broadcast media has been used for in recent history, it's been to kind of amplify a particular ideology so that people can make sense of the world according to that ideology, whereas you know, with rebel wisdom and these, this whole conversational space is in, an invitation for individuals to take responsibility for their own sense-making and their own ability to move through the world with their autonomy and sovereignty or however you want to frame it. And so it's fascinating to hear how you're exploring this kind of edge where you're using broadcast media, right? You're doing things that are you're producing it and you're sending it out to millions of brains, but then you're trying to make that flip so that those brains look down from their devices, turn off listening to some expert. Yeah, that's a tricky, that's a tricky move to make, I imagine, because people really like, I really like, you know, just listening to other people talk and tell me how it is. Mm. Yeah, but there is also a huge desire for spaces for people to to converse that's something yeah. we've really noticed when we when we br bring the that space in in our live events and, uh, and ask people to to express themselves there's a huge buzz in the room there's there's mm. there's a real hunger for people to express themselves mm. um but there is also it, it's it's a very delicate balance to hold because it's very easy to slip back into See, I, I would say this has happened in America with the, uh, with the intellectual dark web. It was framed as a space for right. conversations beyond polarization, but has become a polarizing force in itself. Yeah. Someone is either for <laughs> or against the IDW. And in some sense, as soon as it was named in the New York Times, the paradox was it then became defined as a thing that you were either for or against. Uh-huh. And it's yep. very difficult. I think that's part of what happens in America. I think it, it's almost impossible in, in America to avoid that trap. As soon as you define something, you're then either for or against it, and you just get pulled back into this same polarization trap. And so like the IDW as a phenomenon has not been polarized in that way in the UK? Because I just assumed that that was... I don't think enough people are aware of it for it to have been polarized that way in the, in the UK. Oh, okay. Interesting, interesting, interesting. But yeah, I am yeah, aware. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Jordan Peterson, the IDW, I mean, they're, yeah. they're, they're already, if you're in the US, that they put you on one side of the culture war by definition. Oh, yeah. And it seems oh, very yeah. difficult to avoid that process happening. Um, yes. I would, yeah, I would direct people. I direct people, there's, there's one... There's one interview that we've done, I think, where actually with Jordan Greenhall, and we called it the Intellectual Dark Web 
and genuine conversation, I think it was called, mm. where I think mm. that's the, the, the nearest we've come, me and Jordan, at entering into that collaborative sense-making process on camera. Mm. And it's certainly true that it's an aspiration as much as it is a reality at the moment to, to, to have those kind of conversations. But mm -hmm. I think the first step, the first step really is identifying the people who are able to enter into them. Yes. And yeah. then once you've done that, bringing them together and that's what I think a lot of people were very hungry for when the intellectual dark web first kind of broke cover earlier in 2018. If you watch the conversation between Brett, Eric on the Dave Rubin show and mm. Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro, amazingly. And this was about, they were talking about religion and I think it was, it was pretty much Jordan, Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro both following this real thread of their, un, their understanding of the Judeo-Christian framework and how Jordan's understanding was able to include Ben Shapiro's. And there was a real sense of intellectual engagement and connection mm -hmm. and, and, and ability to come to a sort of a greater synthesis in that conversation that was really exciting. And you kind of, that's what I think people were really excited about was this sense of it's an alive conversation that's definitely going somewhere. And yeah. there's an ability of everyone to enter into this. Whether yeah. someone like Ben Shapiro is able to enter into that same conversation about something like name a hot culture war topic, abortion rights or whatever, yeah, yeah. rather than Ben Shapiro destroys leftist snowflake, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Who knows? Yeah. But there yeah. was certainly a quality in a lot of those conversations that was genuinely emergent and genuinely, and it comes and goes as well. I think some conversations have that and some conversations don't. It's a, it's a process. You could use a, a good analogy is, um, improv comedy. Mm -hmm. One of the, the rules of improv comedy is always yes. And mm -hmm. that whenever you're doing a scene in improv comedy, if someone brings something in, you don't say, they say, ah, oh, we're on a fire engine. You don't say, no, it's not. It's a spaceship. You say, yeah. yes, it's a fire engine and it's got a penguin driving it. And it's, right. <laughs> and it's because if you yeah. don't yeah. You kill yeah. the scene. And so it's a yeah. really crucial, yeah. it's a really crucial value to bring in to any conversation is a yes. And which is something I've tried to do from the beginning with rebel wisdom is to say yes. And to Jordan Peterson, for example, we've done a couple of um, shows, uh, the Peterson paradox and the Peterson th synthesis, where we, we had some criticisms of Jordan Peterson. And I think mm. there are things that he can be criticized on, but I think we've done it from a place of, genuine appreciation for the value that he's bringing and the space that he's holding and and the the skill that he has which is why and i think that value of yes and is why we've been able to have the success that we've had so far mm. yeah well and and so i also had or at least attempted to have one of these maybe we can call them generative conversations with jordan greenhall and, and somebody named bonita roy who I love, and I, I suggest you, you speak with her if you haven't already for Rebelism. She's an incredible person uh, exploring exactly this space. And what was striking to me is how difficult it is to have these conversations and how systematically we've been trained not to, in, in the opposite of the skill set that it takes to have open-minded, generative, synthetic uh, improvisational discourse. Mm. And so I remember when in the conversation with Jordan, you know, one of the first things he said was, you got to figure out if somebody that you're speaking with is actually capable of doing this thing that we're talking about. Mm. And so, you know, I, I guess what, what comes to mind is, is the other work that you're doing around retreats and workshops, you know, it makes sense to me now at this point in the conversation, the, the, the connection between those two elements of, of your work, right? I mean, uh, 
if we need to have these generative discourses as a civilization in order to really kind of quote unquote make it through this eye of the needle that we're, we're headed up to, then we, we kind of need, we need to unlearn a lot of things and we need to learn a lot of things and we need to do it pretty quick. It seems like. Yes. Uh, and so, yeah, that just kind of clicked for me. It makes sense now the whole kind of, I guess the, the, the larger business model or the larger operating of, of rebel wisdom. Yeah, I think, yeah, I'm suddenly feeling the, the pressure of time. Mm. I think since the Trump election, I had a, I had a feeling that he was going to get elected and I had a, a, a very strong sense of, for quite a long time, I had a very strong sense that this kind of, these structures that we're taking for granted are nowhere near as stable as we think they are and, and mm. that things have the chance, have the potential to kind of go south very quickly. Um, and I certainly feel that. And, and yeah, that, that is the thing that we need is, we need to develop these skills of intersubjective, generative, emergent dialogue very, very urgently. And I think everyone else in this space, I know Jamie Wheel feels this very keenly as well, Jordan Greenhall, uh, I'd probably add Brett Weinstein to that as well, recognizes how difficult this project is and how we're kind of threading the eye of a needle in some sense. Mm -hmm. And yeah that it, it, it's not an easy thing to do. And it's very easy to come out of, Jordan Greenhall talks about sovereignty when we're in sovereignty and when we're not. There's, there's a few people that I think should be brought into the conversation as well. Um, there's, there's work that's been done in, in neuro, I guess you call it neuro, neurobiology around something called polyvagal theory and somatic work which completely mm -hmm. revolutionized the, the work of, of transformational, kind of the, the more personal growth work that we do, mm. where we realize now a lot more about trauma. And mm. trauma is defined as anything we're not able to integrate. And mm. this, this realization that the, the, the importance of the vagus nerve in moderating our sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system we are either, I don't want to go too much into the science of it, but effectively we are either in an exploratory framework or we're in a defensive framework. Mm -hmm. And if we're in a defensive framework, we are unavailable. We're unavailable for inquiry. We're unavailable for curiosity. We're unavailable for dialogue. Whereas if we're in the, the, the more positive space, and I need to learn more about this as well. I'm kind of, I'm, I'm at the edge of my, my knowledge, but I want mm -hmm. to talk to two of the guys who, who've done this work. If we're in this exploratory framework, that's when we're curious, when we're inquiring, yes. when we're in a space yes. of genuine, and we do this in our workshops as well. We call it inquiry. And we yes. ask people sort of close your eyes, go in, be curious about what you find, be curious about what happens in your life, talk to this other person and come from a space of genuine inquiry. Why do I do this? wow, I've never, I've never thought about how these things fit together before. I never realized that this might be a reason that I do this. And yes. that's an absolutely essential skill. And it's one that we have to very consciously develop. And there are various other ways of doing that as well. I know maybe other listeners to this have heard of something called circling. Mm -hmm. Circling is a practice that is very much based on the same principles as inquiry. Mm. What am I feeling? What is happening in the space that's arising between us as I'm talking? Wow. Mm -hmm. and, and being genuinely curious. And, and that can only happen from yeah, a place of sovereignty and a place of where we're not being pulled out of that space by our stuff, for want of a better word. Yeah. It's a tricky position to be in because on the one hand, I also, like you mentioned, I feel this urgency. Like it does feel like time is running out. And I don't, I don't know how true that is, or if that's just a sense. Uh, and I, I invite anybody listening to, to come and, and tell me why I, I shouldn't feel that way. Um, I would prefer not to feel that way, actually. Um, but I, nonetheless, I do feel that way right now, that there's a mm. sense that time is running out. And, and yet it seems that like all these thinkers and, and in my own experience, and I'm hearing this from you, we're kind of triangulating towards, we actually have to go really slow now. 
and be really curious and exploratory and open and generative. And it's like, oh, that's a very tricky chasm to kind of walk down. Like on either side, you fall over and it's, uh, yeah. It's I did say it's like threading a needle before. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It's very much so like threading a needle. And um, I guess this is, a, 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 I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on this. Are you, are you optimistic? I am. I think it's. I think it goes back to Star Wars. <laughs> Go on. I, I like to think of this kind of Luke in Star Wars, feeling the Force, kind of taking away his guidance system. Mm. I mean, that is our modern myth. That's our modern religion. So it's it's mm. got to be true. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there, there is there is. I mean, I lie. I laugh. It's kind of a. I'm being only slightly facetious. I do think that there is something in that. I do think there's something in, mm. yeah, we need to gain access to that liminal space. We need to gain access to that space that, that knows what to do, that knows what, what is appropriate to the times. Yeah. And I think un unless we're acting from that space, then I think whatever we bring forth is not going to be equal to the times. Mm. And mm. then, and I also feel certainly that sense of, time running out it's not helped when some of the most intelligent people we've interviewed have are also saying the same thing um but also it's like what is i as a journalist i look around at the world and i see so many existential threats that that it's it's i mean at the moment a lot of people are focusing primarily on the environmental threat yeah but i i look at i look at world politics i look at um, yeah, yeah. kind of we're, we're still only halfway through the Trump presidency. I mean, I, I just see so many threats that on the, on, on the horizon that it's, it's difficult to get kind of overwhelmed by any particular one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I don't want to go too far into the existential risk rabbit hole, uh, right yeah, now. There's people who know about this a lot better than yeah. I do. Yeah, I just know enough to be very worried. <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm also, I mean, I know we, we've kind of interacted online around this as well. I, I am. Yeah. I'm concerned at how neatly so many of, so much of the kind of apocalyptic thinking maps onto the deep religious framework. Yeah, yeah, yeah I've, I've seen you mention that. Yeah. Well, well d d describe your position on that, because I'd love to talk well, to you a little bit about this. All I would, I mean... I don't know the, I'm not a climate scientist, for example, so I don't want to go too deeply into the science or express an opinion about that. But I would say, I, I don't see many people coming forward with what I would consider to be an integral or a balanced framework around climate change, for example. And I'm, mm. which I think would acknowledge certainly how neatly it fits onto a a very sort of religious framework. We're all, we're all doomed. We need to repent right now. Yes. Is it genuinely about climate change or is it about changing people? If you heard that there was a technological solution tomorrow for climate change, how would that make you feel? Would you be relieved or would you actually think, no, that's not the point. The point is that people need to stop being selfish. They need to stop being disrespectful to the environment, they need to stop being et cetera, et cetera. What, what's the deeper, is it about changing people or is it about changing the environment? I mean, that would be, that'd be yeah, one yeah. suggestion, but the other, the other key thing, I mentioned an integral framework for me, that would be to say, yes, there are all of these factors that are pushing us towards apocalyptic thinking on, mm. on this subject. And yet, yes. Right. Cause I don't see much acknowledgement there seems to be this sort of pseudo naivety among people who I'd say sort of a more kind of kind of apocalyptic on, on climate stuff that, mm -hmm. that seems to say, no, everything's settled. Science is just, science is completely objective. It's like science is a human, is a human mm -hmm. endeavor like anything else. Grant money is given for certain things. I know how the media works. There are big institutional biases Yes. Towards a certain narrative and towards groupthink on these things. I'm not saying that it that it's wrong, but yes. I would like to hear people acknowledge that and say, but still, 
I believe this because of this, this or this. And I don't see that. I don't see an ability to hold that complexity among a lot of people in this space. And if I'm really honest, the people that I see with the ability to hold that kind of complexity, I often find coming from a place of less apocalyptic uh, rhetoric around climate specifically. Hmm. Um, That's not to say there are not other kind of big existential threats as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I've had a lot of conversations on the podcast and some more coming up about existential risk and, and, and climate collapse and all of those uh, very real specters and in, 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 at the very least in our, in our psyches. And, and for me, the, 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 the through line for this entire conversation we've been having is like, if you're certain about it, then you shut down so much of what's needed in any case. Like, it's not like it's going to be an apocalypse and all of a sudden you just cease to exist. Like mm. things are going to change rapidly and you're going to be called forth to respond in ways that you don't even know about, right? Or like things will get better and you'll play a part in that. Or, or we, but we just don't know. And so the, the boring thing is to be certain. Yeah. And the only honest answer is to just be more deeply uncertain or at least... <laughs> <laughs> you know, reasonably uncertain, like just like, and that, and that keeps open that space of possibility, which I think, you know, from our conversation, I feel more like that's really a lot of the gift of the IDW is that they're just opening up this space of possibility where something new can be born. Yes. And the, the lesson, if anything, is beware of ideology, AKA beware of certainty, beware of anything that tries to put things in a neat box and then tie it up and, and put it, in a closet like Mm. let's just keep this going that there's a kind of dialogical process that we can engage in Uh, yeah uh, yeah certainty i mean i i find i find especially like the the climate piece at the moment i'm not gonna say terrifying but i am very perturbed by how much certainty there is and how out of control the rhetoric can get when it is framed as we are facing imminent extinction. What are you going to do about this imminent extinction? I mean, there's nothing off the table once things are framed in that way. There's nothing that you can, there's nothing that you would really rule out if if you're establishing that those are the stakes and that's how near we are. And that's where, that's the level of response that we're required to give. And, yeah. and I, I do worry what kind of, yeah, what, because it's also a kind of catch 22 because by framing yourself as wanting nuance or wanting a conversation or wanting some kind of dialogue around that, you can be framed as well. You're just not taking this seriously. You are a, you're right. on the side of the, the ex- extermination of <laughs> yeah. all life on earth. Yeah, well, well, I'm curious, you know, you're in the UK and, and I've been watching the development of the Extinction Rebellion. Uh, do you have any kind of commentary on that? Any perspective on that? That's what I was thinking. I, I, I was aware as I was talking, you guys, it hasn't kind of broken cover quite as much in the US as it has in the UK. So Extinction Rebellion is a kind of grassroots climate movement that has a very, yeah, I find a lot of things that they do, I, found, I find their use of skulls very troubling. Uh-huh. They're a lot, they use a lot of iconography based around skulls. Uh-huh. And if I kind of look back at what other organizations in the past have sort of uh-huh. driven political movements based around skulls, I find it very interesting that, that that's the kind of iconography that they're choosing to use. I'm not sort of saying that there's never any place for activism. There clearly is, but it's a very different thing to, to inquiry. And, and that's what I'm personally interested in and and want to kind of see more of. Yeah. I'll probably get into trouble for the skulls thing. (laughs) Yeah. It's, it's, it's curious. I mean, I've been watching it over here. I had one of the co-founders, Gail Bradbrook on the show and, and, at least, and, and I know because I, I participate in Occupy Wall Street that the, uh, there can be a lot of philosophical robustness and nuance in the mind and heart of the founders or the instigators. 
but then it, you know, to some degree, it, it, it's out of your hands by the time it becomes a mass movement. And then it, 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 it can just go anywhere. You know, it is in some respects, a kind of collective intelligence that you don't have control over anymore. And so I loved Gail and I thought that she had beautiful perspectives on grieving and mm -hmm. the need to be honest with ourselves about what we're doing to the planet, whether or not we're, you know, destroying it, we're certainly messing it up pretty bad. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's, that's undeniable. Uh, and, uh, but then, yeah, like it can easily escape the, uh, the embrace of the people who have good intentions who founded it. It also reminds me a little bit of Jonathan Haidt's work uh, around the coddling of the American mind where he talked about how this culture of kind of microaggressions on campus was mm -hmm. effectively, was really count and basically students being told always to take things the worst possible way hmm. was direct. And a lot of the, the reasoning that was coming through in the last few years was directly counter to what you'd be taught in cognitive behavioral therapy, for example, which says whenever you have a thought, think about whether that thought is true, what that thought means, and, and just to stop yourself catastrophizing most of the time. And I do worry that there's a lot of catastrophizing going on. Yeah, personally, I'll just share my perspective on, on this is that I, I kind of choose to act as if extinction is, an, is a real threat because it calls me forth to participate in life in a more beautiful and, and meaningful way. Mm. You know, like the kind of person that I become when I live in a time when like everything's on the line mm. is... Uh, more of the person I want to be than the person who I would be if I thought that things were chill. Mm. And so there's a little bit of motivated reasoning there on, on, on my part, but I actually think that's, that's kind of okay. Like we're all doing that in our own way. Yes. Um, and I think I'd agree with think, that. Yeah. I think I implicitly feel the same. Um, yeah. In the glitch in the matrix film, Jordan Greenhall talked about this polarization driven by social media as an existential threat that we 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 broken off into two camps effectively humans had different capabilities and what we've seen is those with certain capabilities going off into one camp and certain capabilities going off into the other camp and that that splitting was existentially was an existential threat and mm. i agree i agree with that i i feel that we are in the times where the stakes are that high and I know that my particular piece is mm. in trying to create a dialogue and it's a sense making thing. I mean, basically mm. what rebel wisdom is, is an attempt to make, to create a sense making framework network mm. and create the space for intersubjective sense making to emerge. Mm. And that I'm, I'm convinced that that is my particular piece to own in the existential struggle that mm. we're going through. Beautiful. Well, I, it's honorable and important work. And I think, I mean, from just my perspective, you're doing a great job. Like it's really, it's, it's helping me make sense. And it's helping a lot of people I know make sense of the world. Uh, and so, yeah. Uh, and, and it's also, you know, part of what is drawing me forth into this into this conversation and so it's it's uh, an exciting time to be doing this kind of work i think um and so uh as we kind of uh, draw towards the end of this conversation i'm curious david if there's anything on your mind or in your heart that you'd like to to share with the folks who might be listening no um let me think we've just brought out a few films with ken wilber mm -hmm. um which is something we haven't mentioned so far, but I know that we, we both share an interest in kind of that, that framework. And yeah. it's something that, yeah, I, I guess I, I kind of end by saying, I do think there's a lot of other perspectives that I, I saw the intellectual dark web as the beginnings of this conversation. And I do think that there are really important voices that need to be added to it. Yes. And I think, for example, Ken Wilber and the integral framework that he produced was a really important map. And it's one that I think Jamie Wheel said to me recently that a lot of people who are currently breaking trail 
are running an integral OS. Yes. Integral operating system. And I think that's, that's probably true. Yeah. And, and I, yeah, I, I just, I guess I just urge people to kind of have a look at the channel and we're trying to follow the thread of this emergent conversation as I, I know you are on your podcast as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, maybe get in touch and suggest some other people that we might want to speak to. Cause yeah. I, I'm sort of making so far, I've been going mostly on instinct of yeah. what are the pieces that are missing? Where do we need to go? How do we bring this person into the conversation? What does this person have to add? And I, I don't know if you're familiar with the Enneagram. Yes. Yeah. So I'm, if anyone knows the Enneagram, it's a, it's a really interesting personality tool. So I'm an Enneagram five. Hey, me too, man. Oh yeah. (laughs) Maybe that's the the curator, the curator role. Well, the (laughs) the Enneagram five, the, it's the detached observer. I mean, I'm I'm such a stereotypical Enneagram five. It's the philosopher, the journalist, but but the (laughs) skill of the five is to be a, is to be a sort of slightly detached and be able to see how things fit together. So that's Mm. really what I hope and what my aim is with rebel wisdom is to stay open enough myself and my co-founder Alexander Biner, who is running the events and mm. um, between us to really stay open to where this conversation wants to go and to be able to respond to it and to, yeah, to help, to help it emerge in the way that it wants to emerge and to continue to get mm. out of our own way mm. enough to be able to, to, to allow it to come through in the way that it wants to, if that's not mm. too hippie for your audience. Probably it's okay for your yeah, audience. Yeah, I like it. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful intention. Yeah, thank you, yes. David. Thank you for this conversation and, and, and thank you for the work you're doing. I think it's, it's very valuable. Yeah, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Mm-hmm.